Good morning from London. This is Bloomberg Markets Today. I'm Guy Johnson alongside Critty Gook. The cash trade is just around an hour away. So what do you need to know? Six hours and 30 minutes until US CPI data hits the trading screens. Investors on tenterhooks ahead of the key inflation data. Gold is holding its record high. Brent crude slipping below 90 bucks a barrel. We're going to be joined by this man. Francisco Blanche, head of commodities at B of A, is going to be with us. And Apple accelerates its pivot to India and away from China. TSMC rides the AI boom. Numbers out a few minutes ago show its quarterly revenues growing at their fastest pace in over a year. Oh, yeah, we're going to be talking tech this morning. And that may actually be driving the markets because futures are indicated higher. You're looking at Eurostock 50 futures higher by six tenths of 1%, a similar margin for the FTSE 100. We're seeing a little bit of a yawn fest, we'll call it, is in the bond and FX market. U.S. tenure at about 436 ahead of that CPI report in the States. And Euro dollar 108 kind of feels like everyone's waiting for that report. We're going to dive into it. Marcus Today starts right now. Good morning and welcome. Wednesday, the 10th of April, a day we've been waiting for. It is U.S. CPI Day in America. We're going to be watching out for Fed Minutes. We're going to be watching out for the Bank of Canada. We've already had the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. And the other critical piece of news is that Kriti Gupta is back. <laughs> she is back from Italy. Why anybody would leave Italy is beyond me. We're still figuring it out. Uh, sadly, I don't have an Italian paycheck to go with my Italian vacations. Uh, so I had to come back. I had to. Okay. But I, I, did my I got part. a tie out of it. So I did my part to boost the Italian economy. Yep. I'm waiting for my commission. This is so, so you and Alex Steele basically supporting the Italian economy, as far as I can tell. Just us two and nothing else, yeah, apparently. That, that seems us to be. Us two and Georgia Maloney. <laughs> do, do, the, do, the three of you are doing a great job, it seems, <laughs> it seems right now. Crudy has an issue with some of my ties. She thinks they're a little bit bland. Um, so. Zoom in. They have Vespas on them. They I do. Think they're, they're very in, in style, in yep. focus. The You're Dolce welcome. Vita, the Dolce Vita, fantastic. Yes. I'm very happy. Thank you very much indeed. So let's talk about inflation and talk about what we're going to be getting a little bit later on. The market's clearly nervous about this number. Real range of kind of opinions, though, on what it's yeah. going to tell us and a real range of opinions on how the Fed is going to react. It's also, to me, it's the contributions that really matter here because we've heard, I think, in the last 24, 48 hours from, ba from Rafael Bostic over the Atlanta Fed. Traditionally, when we look at this kind of CPI data, we say, where's the services pressure coming from? Because that's going to relate to the labor market. Yep. Now it feels like people are talking about other pieces of the market. Anna Wong over at Bloomberg Economics saying, actually, keep an eye on housing, rent, airfares, for example, the more yep. volatile component as well. Rafael Bostic saying, maybe the labor market isn't what's going to indicate what the Fed does next. So this number really does matter. We keep kind of picking our data points and figuring yeah. out which kind of, kind of how they all relate to each other and what they're going to be doing. But, but this, this divergence is beginning. It feels to me like that there was a period when everybody felt like it, they were on the same page in terms of what was going to be happening next. That now seems to be very different. State Street out with the call that the 50 is going to be going, the Fed's going to be going 50, the 50 is going to be going Fed. In, in June. You got it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I got there eventually. You've got Bob Prince of Bridgewater. I think there's a piece in the FT. He's talking about it this morning. He thinks the Fed is on the wrong page right now. Yeah. He says, hold on to cash. He's, he's saying that the Fed is probably in a position where there's no reason to cut right now, which kind of fits with what Bostick's saying. That's a call that you're seeing more and more people circle back to, which is stick to the cash, stick to the front end of the curve. Yeah. And, and it feels very deja vu because aren't we coming off of, a, off of maybe a couple of months, I want to say even six months, where the bond bull market was really supposed to take off and in the absence of yeah. that, it's kind of like, okay, well, it will eventually, eventually oh. when they cut. Are we going to get two? Are we going to get two bond markets though? Are we going to get a Treasury story, and are we going to get a Bund story? story yeah. And a, well, no, just a gilt story. Oh, I see. Okay. Th there's a bigger kind of trade that's beginning to emerge. We'll talk um, to Catherine Nice about this a little bit later on in the program. Is the Bank of England going to go in May? Could the Bank of England go early? That's a story that I think a lot of people are beginning yeah. to focus on. We've got the ECB tomorrow as well. Let's not forget that. But at the core of that is these European banks central banks, the ECB and the BOE, um, yep. among others, front-running the Federal Reserve. And we thought that when they would, or when there were indications that they would, which are very clear right now that they just might have to, it would show up in the FX market. And the FX market hasn't really blinked that much. So I'm curious if the FX market doesn't react, will the bond market even react? Maybe. I don't know which way around that's going to work. There are calls out there for kind of 105. There are calls out there for parity when it comes to uh, what we're going to see in terms of euro dollar. Yeah, so but... Like it, it, even I don't, when we're not calls, there yet. We are not there yet. We're not by, there yet, but no. I think 
the margin matters, right? And I think that's a similar story when you talk about oil as well. Like, how quickly yep. can the dynamic change? I think that's part, that's the basis of this call you're seeing, where everyone says, stick on the sidelines, stick into money markets, because that's what we're waiting for. Because anything can happen, which I know is always the case, but there seems to yep. be an extra element of that this time around. It does seem that we are heading into a period where we are going to see maybe divergence between the central banks, um, European central banks versus the Fed. Look at the, the RBNZ overnight. Yeah. Out with, out with a call that sounds significant, well, not significantly, it sounds more hawkish than maybe the market was anticipating, and certainly the idea that it needs to keep restrictive policy in place so that it can make sure that it deals yeah. with inflation feels like maybe it's maybe, maybe closer to the Fed than it is to the ECB or the Bank of England. But you know what? I, you li we like to look at, uh, I keep wanting to say RBNZ, and it's not a Z, it's Z, RBNZ, uh, for, for, for me. But, um, we are assimilating you. I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to sound very pretentious in a few minutes. Um, but, but I think what's important about these kind of more commodity-exposed economies is they... I feel have always been kind of a canary in the coal mine, especially when we talk about rising oil prices right now. So, for example, Norges Bank is going to get interesting. The Aussie Bank is, uh, sorry, the Royal Bank, the RBA is going to get interesting. Yep. I'm still on vacation, mind. You can clearly see that. Uh, but even even the Chinese, the PBOC, is going to be really interesting because of the commodity read-through. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of deja vu. We talked about in the bond market, the fact that the oil price and the commodity story matters again for a lot of central banking policy, I think, is important, especially in election season on both sides of the Atlantic. Let's talk about some of the corporate news, because yeah. I think it does fold in. So I think Tesco is an interesting example of that yeah. today in terms of the inflation narrative here in the UK. Um, adjusted operating profit, $2.83 billion. That's a, little, that's a little shy. I just want to see like-for-like -like sales plus 68 um, I can't see a commentary that goes with this at the moment. Maybe we'll dig into that a little bit later. But there is still this, this cost of living story in the UK, which is, we're, we're writing about it today, over 7 million people are still kind of being hit by this cost of living squeeze and are still struggling with their bills. Inflation is a narrative that is, that is really problematic still for a lot of people. And it's problematic for Joe Biden. That takes us back to the US story as well. Yeah. A lot of people, John Authors is writing about this on the terminal this morning, talking about the fact that the market's going to focus on the core. But actually, it's the anti-core that everybody else is focusing on, particularly yeah. the politicians. Can I just mention very quickly that Tesco is also launching a £1 billion buyback? <laughs> in addition to, to, to these numbers. I think that's important because even in this inflationary environment, you can still see the same yep. behavior of a lot of these corporates saying, we have excess cash, what are we going to do with it? Which is interesting because the last time we were navigating this environment of higher inflationary prices, a potential double peak, higher oil prices, we, didn't, we saw a little bit more caution by these corporates. It doesn't seem to be showing up just yet. And I bring it back to the oil price because we keep seeing the sensitivity to what's going to happen in the oil price. Yeah. by the stock market, by the bond market. But in terms of how people are actually strategizing for the next couple of quarters, it's not part of their view just yet. It's raising its semi-annual dividend as well, 17% to 8.25 pence a share. So the UK stocks, valuations to many people look like they're problematic right now. Yeah. But these are companies that are kicking out cash. And, and that is a trend that at some point maybe people will notice. But is that something, I'm, I'm curious how that, and, and, and you're the expert here, huh. how does that change in terms of what the BOE does, right? Because at what point is, is a rate cut actually positive for equities as opposed to a rate cut because there are growth concerns and that being a negative? Probably. I think for the FTSE 100 it's a different story. The FTSE 100 is very allied to what happens with the currency. So the currency goes down, the FTSE 100 goes up. Yeah. It's a translated story. Tesco's is a bit different on that front, but a lot of the FTSE 100 kind of takes you along those lines, Shell being, uh, being an obvious example. Yeah. Um, TSMC out with numbers this morning. They look super strong. That's, yeah. I, this is, they make all of NVIDIA. They make the bulk of NVIDIA's chips. That, that, I, they're up really strongly. The sales numbers are always complicated, but they look pretty strong this morning. Yeah. Apple as well, this, this pivot continues away from China into India. Two really interesting stories there, yeah. I think. Away from China into India, and then for the TSMC, the story about this active investment into the States at, at yep. a time when we don't even know what the, the policy in 12 months' time is going to look like when it comes to that. The fact that TSMC is really hedging kind of a lot of their geopolitical bets and their geopolitical tensions by moving a lot of their manufacturing, investing in a really big way in the United States, and yep. Phoenix in particular, is important. We had Tim Culpin on in, in the last hour from Bloomberg Opinion saying... It is a big investment. It's not as big as people are thinking it is. And it's really dependent on a lot of these targets that they have to meet by the U.S. government. Do you start to see European governments then create their own incentives? And this is kind of a, a good Macron it's a, But it's a subsidy story, isn't it? Yeah. And, and the Taiwanese have always been very good at providing a lot of subsidies to make sure that these plants get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. The U.S. is now getting into that game and is going to try and scale up quite quickly. It's not just TSMC, it's Intel, etc. Intel out. Try yeah. a challenge as well on the on the accelerator front when it comes to Nvidia. Yeah. So so the race is on. But this comes back to this: is this 
do you need to take this back to the geopolitics, this kind of containment story, this economic containment story that the U.S. is trying to drive through at the moment when it comes to China? There's that. There's also the sustainability of it in that a lot of these plants are expected to come online in years, 10 years even, by the end yep. of the decade perhaps, at the earliest. Um, and remember, there are, there are U.S. election politics out as well. These are expensive subsidies, expensive grants coming from the U.S. government. Yep. Can they even afford it in the next administration? Well, I think, so that's one of the biggest questions I think a lot of people are asking as well is, is what happens in a Trump administration to yeah. the IRA? What happens to the CHIPS Act? What happens to the kind of policy that is yeah. driving this kind of investment? Does that go away? And if the fiscal impulse fades significantly, what does U.S. growth look like? And is it still exceptional? Well, the other piece, so there's two sides of that equation, right? On the Biden administration, you have a continuation of that policy. He may want that from a kind of campaigning perspective. Yeah. Again, he might not be able to afford it. Again, January 2025, those debt ceiling talks come right back. The IRA, although helpful in terms of that fiscal impulse that you were talking about, was met with a lot of pushback because it was feeding yep. that U.S. deficit that's only growing. Um, we're going to talk about defence stocks a little bit we'll later it, on. That's yeah. kind of the narrative as well here in Europe. Can Europe continue to afford to invest in all the things that it wants? Yesterday we saw a big drawdown in terms of some of the defence stocks. Does that continue today? Goldman Sachs out with a note. The, these challenges, these fiscal challenges look like we, we spend a lot of time talking about the monetary side. Yeah. But actually in reality, so much of what is happening right now is fiscal rather than monetary. But, but the markets are obsessed with the How do you even price it in? I think it's really difficult. Yeah. I, I think it shows up in the data and it shows up in the differences in the data we're seeing. And maybe that's why the next 24 hours is going to see a U.S. inflation number that is showing that the U.S. economy is, is pushing on, whereas a, an ECB that is probably in urgent need of maybe cutting rates. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to, to digest there. Um, let's walk you through what else we have coming up in today's uh, trading session at 12 p.m. UK time, U.S. MBA mortgage applications. Remember, a lot of the focus is going to be on the housing sector ahead of those CPI numbers, so we are going to be watching for that as well. In terms of 1.30 p.m., it's that big report, the U.S. inflation report. Is it housing? Is it airfares? Is it back to the services-driven data? We're going to dive into that as well. 6 p.m. UK time, the 10-year note auction worth about $39 billion. Is liquidity still a concern in this bond market? Doesn't seem to be, but who knows? It could rear its ugly head again. And at 7 p.m. London time, those Fed meeting minutes are going to be released. It feels like we've had a lot of Fed speak since then, so maybe not the most tradable piece of information, but still anything will help. And of course, that U.S. monthly budget statement all coming up as well. I'm curious to hear about how the bond market then squares these issues, right? Because if we're going back to a circle where we're talking about a re another uptick in inflation or another uptick in, in oil yeah. prices, this kind of low volatility in the bond and FX market, what is going to move the dial? I don't know. I, I think, so positionings, I think you've got, to, you've got to start from kind of where you are, and I think that's really important. This is where the bond market is. This is where positioning is. So I think you need to see today's number in that light. Yeah. I, the, the bond market has pushed quite a lot in one way at the moment. You saw a little bit of squaring yesterday. It felt like there was some short covering yesterday, or at least some insurance being taken out. Um, some big block trades going through. So I, I, I think the market feels shorter on bonds than it's been for a while, but maybe neutral going into this number. So that could, that could generate some volatility. And Dan, Dan Curtis has got a great chart showing that actually we are seeing volatility beginning to tick up before some of these big, big, big yeah. data prints, particularly out of the States. Yeah, look, I'll admit, I haven't been checking in on the bond market for two days now, or two yep. of the trading sessions. I've, I've been living the Dolce Vita. But I expected that when I came back from, from my, my time off, the yields on the 10-year would be a whole lot higher because I think I left at like 440 and now it's at 435. I expected it to continue that hike yeah. up to 4.5, and, and we've seen the exact opposite. This time yesterday, we, I, I think that's the positioning story. Yeah. The market has maybe taken a, little, a few chips off the table going into these numbers, and I think yeah. maybe that is, a, that is a, I am short, I need to, to, to maybe reduce some of that risk. There was a yeah. massive block trade that maybe suggested that yesterday. Interesting lines from Ken Murphy, the chief executive over at Tesco. Inflationary pressures have lessen lessened substantially, he says. However, we are conscious that things are still difficult for many customers. We'll come back to that Tesco story a little bit later. Talking of inflation, gold holding at a record high ahead of the data later today. We're going to talk commodities. We're going to talk oil. We're going to talk gold. Copper's on a tear as well. Francisco Blanche, B of A's uh, head of global commodity research is going to be joining us. Plus, we've just been speaking about it as well. Defence stocks under pressure. GS yesterday warning that the sector's recent rally has left valuations looking, well, a little punchy. We're going to get the latest on that. You want to join the conversation? Feels like the morning you want to join in. Everybody's got an opinion on this inflation story. Join the chat. IB Plus TV Go is the function. This is Bloomberg.
may well see the ECB cut as often, if not more, than the Fed, which was unimaginable a few months ago. It is having a huge impact on, the, on relative pricing between Europe and the US. And you do see that in the bond market, you see it in the currency market. Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohammed El Arian talking to us a little bit about that divergence between the central banking story on both sides of the Atlantic. Let's get a little bit more on that and bring in Catherine Nice, chief European economist over at PGM Fixed Income. Good morning and uh, from London. Catherine, walk us through the story of divergence between the United States and, and Europe. There's a lot of questions about whether or not Europe outpacing the United States is one of kind of necessity and, and dire need. How big of a difference does it actually make? Well, I think the interesting story, you know, not that long ago was how the market's expectations for cuts were, were broadly in lockstep across uh, Europe, where I'm including the UK as well, and uh, the US. And at the time, I think the view was, you know, how long can this go on for? Because clearly the macro fundamentals are are not aligned across these two regions. And so I think that speaks to this divergence that we are seeing now. And we have to remember that in the case of the ECB and even at the Bank of England, they were saying to us at the time that they were putting in these rate hikes that some of those latter hikes were insurance hikes to protect against a wage price spiral in the case of, of uh, the ECB and for the UK, concerns around uh, fiscal expansions. So these insurance cuts can come out as well as reflecting the macro fundamentals. And I think that is really what inter underpins this divergence we're, we're expecting now. So, Catherine, you mentioned those fiscal expansions. I want to dive into that here because we're talking a lot about maybe how monetary policy could have their hands tied. A lot of the outperformance, specifically in the likes of Spain and Italy, for example, is mostly driven by fiscal policy. How long can that continue? Is are fiscal budgets in Europe something we should be paying more attention to than the ECB? Well, I think it is going to be a big theme in the coming weeks and months. Uh, the stability and growth pact rules were waived, of course, for a number of years uh, due to the emergency situation associated with the pandemic and then uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So it took a little bit of a backseat and monetary policy really was, uh, you know, the conversation um, that 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 was was the topic of conversation. But now that these stability and growth pact rules are coming back to the fore, uh, we're going to hear a lot more headlines around countries such as Italy, uh, but also France going into an excessive deficit procedure. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see markets get a little bit jittery around that. But stepping away from this sort of near term data flow, I think the really big picture, and this is a theme that we've been talking about for some time is, you know, in the decade before the pandemic, it was really monetary policy that was in the driving seat in supporting economies across the globe. And fiscal was really in the back seat. You know, austerity was the rule of the day. And we're basically seeing a flip of that. And it's fiscal that is in the driving seat. It's doing the heavy lifting, yep. supporting economies. And it's monetary policy that's in the back seat trying to restrain things and ensure that nominals don't run away from us. So it's, it's a big shift in the policy mix that we're seeing now. Catherine, just to kind of follow on that, is Europe making a mistake, therefore, not being more expansionary? The, the U.S. is expansionary. It's got, a, it's got a very strong fiscal policy at the moment. Biggest kind of deficits I think we're running in peacetime ever. Is, is Europe making a mistake? Because you could argue that one of the upsides to that policy is that basically we are building up the supply side of the economy in the States in a way that we're not in, in Europe, and that ultimately is going to drive higher productivity in the States at some point. I think this is the question that is going to be on policymakers' mind in Europe in the run-up to these European parliamentary elections and is going to drive policy thinking over the course of this year. And we will have a sense of what is the direction of travel there as we go through this year. 
But the bottom line is there are three major economic regions, China, the U.S., the euro area, and China and U.S. are now playing the game on a different set of rules with major industrial strategies. And Europe either has to uh, play by those same yep. rules or, or fall behind. And one thing we don't forget, we, we, we often forget, is that the euro area as a whole, if we look at it as one economic region, it actually has a very low level of debt to GDP, significantly lower than China, of course, or Japan, but lower than the US and even individual G7 economies. So the fiscal space is there. What is lacking is the mechanism yeah. to to, uh, use that fiscal space in a way that is strategic for the region as a whole. This is going to drive their thinking, I think, in uh, the next couple of months. Catherine, just to get back to the monetary, Ken Murphy, uh, he's the CEO of Tesco. They've just delivered numbers out a few minutes ago. One of the lines that comes out from him, inflationary pressures have lessened substantially, he says. You think the Bank of England goes in May and delivers a cut? How, how certain are you of that? How close a call is that? I would say it's odds on, but it's not a super high conviction call. Um, the point about inflation coming off, I think that's particularly true in essentials. Uh, things that people are you know, spending the bulk of their uh, monthly income on and that really affects our day-to-day -day living. I'm talking about food and energy. So I see it in my weekly shop that prices are actually falling for certain regular items that I buy and we're expecting energy prices to fall back as well uh, as these uh, off-gem changes, price changes to energy prices come through in April. And that's going to uh, give a lot of relief, I think, to households for the everyday essentials uh, that they buy. And of course, we are expecting headline inflation to really fall back markedly and potentially yep. below the 2% inflation target. And so I think for the Bank of England, they were seen, it's not my view, but I think a, a yep. common view out there is that they were too late hiking. They don't want to look like they're too late cutting. Yeah, they, the pace originally was very slow. Um, you used to work at the Bank of England. So just give me your take on what Bernanke is going to be saying when he delivers his report later on this week in terms of A, forecasting, B, communication. Is it going to make a difference? Am I going to be able to understand the Bank of England's reaction function better post-Bernanke than I am now? My sense is this review is going to be more impactful uh, from the outside observer than perhaps previous reviews have been. Uh, the Bank of England is not used to the kind of criticism that it's come under, and I think they really want to regain that uh, position, that reputation with outside observers. So I would expect it to have a look and feel that, that things are changing, are going to change uh, for, for the bank. What are the kinds of things I might be looking out for? I expect them to, you know, maybe dump the fan chart. Uh, it's, it's painful to say I was there in the early days when um, we were putting that thing together. Do some more stress testing, essentially, of their base case around conditioning assumptions. I'm not expecting a dot plot, but, you know, it, it could happen that we see that. And I think one thing that... Um, I would very much like to see is a press conference yeah. after every single Bank of England meeting. They really need to come out and explain the decisions that they're making, not four times a year, uh, but after eight, each of the eight meetings that they, they have right. every year to really kind of enhance that communication to the market, to uh, consumers, households, businesses yeah. about the decisions that they're making. All right, Catherine Nice, Chief European Economist over at Page of Fixed Income. We thank you so much for joining the program. Coming up, we go into the micro. A Boeing employee says the plane maker took shortcuts to ease production bottlenecks. We're going to dive into that next. This is Bloomberg. Wednesday, the 10th of April, CPI Day in America. We're going to be watching out for that data a little bit later on. In terms of kind of where we are set up going into that number, this is what the markets look like. Uh, as you can see, equity futures largely positive, but not significantly. Though we're up by a half of 1%, which in this low volatility world, low volatility world feels like a, a decent move. But we'll see whether that translates and holds. Um, bond markets... 
keep an eye on what is happening here. This is kind of the centre of the action, you could argue, in terms of what we're looking at. Uh, we are seeing a bid back into the bond market. Yields continue to dip. They did so yesterday. A little bit of positioning maybe going into the print a little bit later on. 1.30 UK time is when we'll see that data dropping. Uh, let's stay stateside and talk about what is happening with Boeing. The FAA is investigating claims made by a Boeing employee who says the plane maker took shortcuts to ease production, production bottlenecks to speak more slowly, uh, for the 787 Dreamliner. In a statement, Boeing says the claims were, quote, inaccurate and don't represent the comprehensive work being done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. What do we know? What do we need to know? Well, let's find out. Bloomberg's Benedict Campbell joins us now. He leads the team that covers this stuff for us here at Bloomberg. Talk me through the whistleblower claims. So the whistleblower came out last night. Uh, he was on a conference call that we all listened to, and he essentially says... There have been production issues on the 787. Just to remind people, there are two pr products essentially by Boeing. The 737 that we've written a lot about, that's the, the smaller plane, yep. and then the 787, the large uh, wide-body aircraft. And it's in the production process of that plane that Boeing allegedly took shortcuts. You have to imagine these are big barrel sections that are stuck together, and wherever you have a joint, you will have small imperfections. So the engineers, the factory workers, have to fix those, have to find those. That's an arduous long-term process, takes time, and that's the kind of time that Boeing tried to save, tried to rush these planes out of the door and didn't fix these imperfections in the way that they should have. As you say, Boeing obviously uh, says, not true, yep. we, we have done this, uh, we've followed due process and so on, but the allegation stands and we saw the stock drop quite dramatically yesterday. Look, there's very few people who can compete with Boeing on this front. Talk to us about the business read-through here in terms of need, in terms of backlog. How much trouble is Boeing actually in? Well, the trouble for them is they have to maintain or regain control of the narrative really at this point. I mean, I think right now, as I said, it's a two-product company, and if you have problems on both of these fronts, both on the 737 and the 787, if you have the public, you have uh, government officials asking questions, that is a real problem for them. They've already slowed down the output of their 737 uh, quite dramatically. We had their delivery numbers yesterday. They're not great. Um, and if they now have a follow-up problem on the bigger plane, that's going to be really dramatic. We heard from the CFO a couple of weeks ago that they'll have a huge cash drain in the first quarter. The question really is, at what point can they stop the bleeding on the financial side? And at what point can they really regain the trust of the flying public? And that's not to be underestimated. Congress is involved. Dave Calhoun is going to be hauled back in front of Congress to talk about this in the next few days. He's going to be, in theory, gone by the end of the year. As soon as they have somebody, are they going to replace him? How quickly does he go? Are we going to, to, to your point, be able to deliver a different narrative with him still at the helm? Yeah, that, I mean, that, as you say, is, is, is really unsustainable for him to stick around until the end of the year. Yes, he's nominally in place until then, but already now, you know, no disrespect, but he's a lame duck at this point. Yep. I mean, he, they have so many things they have to fix. They have to get the production back on track. They have to reintegrate the spirit supplier business. They have to think about their next product. So many huge problems facing the CEO, and this is... These are all issues that the current CEO cannot fix. He cannot lay the, the ground for these things, knowing that he'll be gone soon. So the, the new chairman is working intensively to find a replacement. At this point, it's all speculation. We don't know who that person might be. But I bet you the moment they have somebody, Calhoun will retire and he'll be gone. Can we go through kind of the possibilities here in terms of what may come next for, for Boeing? If we're talking about uh, these safety regulations taking place, what does that look like? Does that look like halted deliveries? Does that look like Airbus is able to make up the gap among others, if there are others? Uh, what, what, what are the ramifications here? Or is this a scenario of too big to fail aerospace edition? Well, that part is certainly true. Boeing is not going to go away. I mean, it, it, it's, as you say, it's a too big to fail company. It's, it, it is the backbone of U.S. manufacturing. There are thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands of jobs attached to this. Um, it's a duopoly between Airbus and Boeing. Um, so very much so, this is a company that is protected, you know, simply by its size. Obviously, we've seen this duopoly 
diverged to some degree. It used to be 50-50, and we've seen Airbus take a larger and larger slice over time. Boeing needs to halt that and needs to come back with a new product. But these products are incredibly expensive. Calhoun, the CEO, came out a couple of weeks ago and said the next 737 will cost $50 billion. Now, that is a huge number, and a lot of people were sort of slightly perplexed to have him put such a big number out there. But even if it's only $30 billion, these are huge outlays. This is something that will determine the future of the company into the next 20, 30, yeah. 50 years. Um, so lots of questions for the next CEO. And potentially who gets there first gets to determine what that aircraft type looks like. Is it big open fan rotors? Is it kind of how, how, the, how the geometry of the aircraft changes to become more efficient will determine how engine manufacturers and everybody else have to respond within the supply chain? That's going to be maybe where Airbus has the advantage. But talking of Airbus, we're all focused on Boeing and the problems mm. that, that, that Boeing is having. Is it all good at Airbus? Is everything kind of clicking and working and delivering at the moment? Or are we still having supply chain problems? Are we still dealing with engine issues? Kind of what's going on there? Because it feels like Airbus is, is kind of top of the class at the moment. You're right. And they, you know, compared to Boeing, they are. You yeah. know, but as you, as you say, they, they do have their own issues. They are obviously far less significant than they are at Boeing. But don't forget, you know, we've both covered this industry long enough to know that these things can change yeah. very quickly. We, we remember that there were times when, when Airbus was in, in real crisis. The A380 wasn't clicking. Um, the 350 needed rework. Um, the whole corporate governance issues, um, the attempt to buy BAE that didn't work out. You know, so lots of things. And back then, Boeing was working. The 787 was doing great. The 737 was selling. And then suddenly the narrative changed again. So if you're in a duopoly, these things can change very quickly. And Airbus is aware of this. They do say, look, we're not here to be glib. We're not here to be clever. Uh, we're, we're looking at what Boeing is happening, but we're not taking any satisfaction out of that whatsoever because we know that could happen to us, and whatever ha bad happens at Boeing is not good for the overall industry. Any, any sort of concern about boarding a plane, yes, that's bad for Boeing in particular, but for the wider industry, it's not yep. a good look. All right, Bloomberg's Benedict Camel, we thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Of course, a complicated story that seems to get no reprieve. Coming up on the program, we take a look at your stocks to watch, including the defense sector, suffering the worst day in 18 months yesterday after concerns about stretched valuations. We're going to dive into it. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to March today. We're about 20 minutes away from the cash equities open. We are seeing futures indicated higher. How much of that is a tech story? How much of that is some sort of uh, maybe building on the momentum we saw yesterday, even if it was marginal momentum? I want to get into the big trading report of today. That is going to be Inflation Day in America. U.S. CPI coming out later today, where economists expect the March report will likely show that the hot inflation readings of the previous two months, well, maybe just a one-time thing as opposed to the start of a more alarming trend. Let's dive into the details. Bloomberg's Europe FX and rates under Alina Oyamada joins us this morning. All right, so there's a lot of worry these last couple of months that, okay, this could be an inflation uptick, a deja vu, a Volcker moment for Jay Powell. Does today's inflation report set all those fears to rest? Hopefully, yes. Um, so the market base case expectation is that the report will show some more cooling down in prices, especially when you look at the core, that should be the lowest reading since 2021. Um, so overall, it could paint a more benignant scenario. Uh, obviously, if you look at the headline number, it can still rise a bit. Um, so we can always get one of those cases where you have kind of a mixed bag or a mixed reading that gives a bit for everyone. Uh, but the market is tilted toward like seeing a more um, softer print today, I think. When we're talking about the positioning story, though, one of the things that Guyana keep talking about is the bond market and the effects market kind of having this big snooze fest and picking out the data that they want. Walk us through the positioning story here. Yeah, so the bond market, the treasury market is very short. Um, you're seeing yield levels at the, highest le uh, at the highest points this year so far. So the case for a more positive um, reaction to the data is bigger than stronger than the case for more sell-off, yeah. uh, simply because you had this huge repricing, a hawkish repricing in the past few weeks, and then yields are so high, positioning is short. So it could be one of those cases when you have... Uh, kind of inline print, and yeah. then that brings some relief to everyone. Bond market's all over the place right now. Doesn't know what to think, doesn't That's know true. where it's going. Yeah. 
I, we got a number of prints before June. Why, why such emphasis being placed on this one? I, do we need to think of this in a series, or is this kind of the big moment? Uh, I think it's more looking at it like a series, but because we had some hot readings over the past two months, right. this will kind of show if that so, was so that's a trade the important thing. The, today, will today confirm whether the hot readings we had at the beginning of the year were the blip? So, so Powell keeps talking about it being yeah. bumpy. And we can dismiss the earlier kind of data. It's going to be a bumpy path down towards two, sort of 2%. Two, two is bumpy. Is three a trend? Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's, the, uh, that's how markets are looking at yeah. it. Like, will it confirm or will it, like, bring even more doubts? Um, one thing that I, th I think makes this figure particularly interesting is that when you look at Fed pricing, the market's kind of divided between two and three cuts. Currently, they are favoring two cuts, and the Fed has indicated uh, three with their dot plot. So how this print will shift the balance toward two or three, that would be interesting to watch. We talked a little bit about the bond market story. FX seems to be, the, the read-through between the bond story and the FX story seems um, almost disjointed a little bit. You're still seeing a lot of strength in these European currencies, whereas the bond market isn't necessarily suggesting that. We talked about positioning in the treasury market. Talk to us about positioning in the dollar. Yeah, so the start for the dollar is still a very strong and bullish one. Um, when you look at specific pairs, there are some that are looking more fragile versus the dollar and others more resilient. Uh, I would highlight the yen and the euro as the biggest yeah. losers um, at this point. Uh, the yen simply because it's at such weak level that everyone is expecting intervention. So there's this whole Japan story and how yeah. they will react. In the euro, you're seeing some people bringing back the parity talk. We're not there yet where this is the base case, or it's that so close. But when people start to talk, then you, it brings us to our radar, right? I'm so glad you mentioned the Japanese yen and parity. We'll put parity aside for a second. You used to be uh, in charge of EM over in Brazil. Yeah. The low FX vol story that we're seeing, is that really just favoring this carry trade, Brazilian real versus the yen, Mexican peso versus the yen? How long does that stay in vogue? Is that really dependent on the Fed? Yeah, it depends a lot on the Fed for sure. Um, but when you look at those uh, carry trade funders like the yen and the Swiss franc, they may continue to be there for a while. And yeah. then the high yielders are always the high yielder as much as Brazil is cutting rates. Um, when you look at the level, it's just there's a big discrepancy. Yeah. Elena, thank you very much indeed for joining us once again. A lot of ground to cut. A lot of ground to cover today. Aline Oyamada joining us on the uh, the FX story. Watch out for that CPI print. 1:30 UK time is when that data is going to drop. Talking of inflation, Tesco out with numbers from the UK this morning. It's forecasting a profit increase this year. It's got a dividend rate. It's got a buyback that is coming through. We are seeing, and they're making much comments of this in terms of the statement this morning, an easing of inflation that is allowing the supermarket chain to cut prices. Remember, in some ways, higher inflation is good for supermarket prices. It gives them room to raise prices, get the top line moving. Joining us now um, is Dasha Afanasia. Uh, Dasha, let's talk a little bit about what the numbers look like today and kind of what Tesco, what is giving Tesco confidence that it can basically push its profit outlook higher from here? Well, it's, it's a bit like you said, it's both the inflation easing off um, and it's the cost-cutting programs that have actually helped them expand margin um, in, in the last period. But I, I think there's also, uh, it's not the most bullish of outlooks because they did have a slight miss on the revenue and also yeah. on their operating profit. So it's still, as ever, such a competitive environment in the UK supermarket space. Talk to us a little bit about affordability here. Uh, every, every person I talk to is saying groceries are getting more expensive and you see it every week. We had Catherine Nice, uh, P. Jim's European economist, talk about it this morning. I'm still recovering from New York grocery prices. So I don't see the difference, but walk us through the numbers here. How much of a difference is it making for the average Brit? Absolutely. I mean, I think you speak, speak of New York and it's kind of a reminder that relative to other things, UK food prices have been historically incredibly cheap. And that's partly down to this intense uh, competition that we have in the supermarkets. But I think in the UK and globally, uh, the, those sharp rises are easing off and it does feel like the worst is over. But that doesn't mean that people aren't super, super stretched. And I think the, the long term impact of higher mortgage rates of highest Food, food shopping, etc., 
uh, is really taking its toll, which is why, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, British consumers are looking to the election for sort of for, for relief and for rate cuts, hopefully, for, for mortgage relief. Um, so it's, you know, it's been a long-term um, yeah. impact. If you want to get the deals at Tesco, you've got to bit the club card. Certainly that's been the story over the last few years. Y you had to have it with you. I have mine on my car keys. Most people have them in their wallets, kind of just to make sure. Because that's where the deals come phone, from. surely. On my phone. Do you know, I, phone I, do you know how old I am? <laughs> um, Guy still sees in black and white. It's the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> um... But I drive to the supermarket, so that's kind of, maybe that's the difference. <laughs> we're getting there, baby we're, steps. We're getting there slowly. How much pressure... Is that a sustainable strategy? Is that something they can continue with? How much political pressure and regulatory pressure is there around that as well? I, mean, I think that's the thing. When, when Tesco says we are the cheapest supermarket and we've cut, uh, you know, the prices on X many products, yeah. they're just talking about the club card. So if you're just going in there cold, if you're, an, you know, just newbie. showed up in the, in the UK and didn't yeah. know the rules of the land then you would be paying really high prices. And the CMA, the Competition Markets Authority, has taken note, and there's currently an investigation. And I think, theoretically, that could affect all of them. And, you know, Sainsbury's as well qu quickly followed suit, I think, increasingly, if you want to get um, what looks like vaguely normal pricing in Sainsbury's, you have to use get your Nectar yep. card, key ring, One of those app. as well, on my, on my car keys. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, and uh, so, so that strategy, you know, they might have to suddenly pivot um, if, there's, if there's pressure, but we're, we're still to find out because the investigation is live now. All right. Have you, well, you, you got one? When you go shopping, do you, do you have one of these things? On my phone. Because you're a, a normal newbie, person. you're a relatively... But, but, but you've got one. You've figured it out. I have figured it out on my phone, like okay. a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> Bloomberg's Dasha Afanasieva walking us through it, and more importantly, pushing Guy towards modernity with me <laughs> as well. Most uh, Her biggest role here. We thank you so much. Let's get some of the other stocks to watch. Joe Easton from our equities team is all over it. Joe, I bet you've got a club card on your phone. I have, yeah. I, I've still got one on my key ring, actually, so I'm with hey. Guy on this one. <laughs> the, little, the little tag on the key ring, it's never going. Um, so we are looking at defence stocks today after a massive sell-off yesterday in these shares, catching the market by surprise. We've got Ryan Mattel in Germany down as much as 7%. Leonardo in Italy fell 9%. Saab hit around 10%. BAE also down as well. Now, there was no real significant driver for this move. But recently we've seen analysts warning that potentially a rally since the two wars broken out has actually now gone too far. Goldman Sachs was one of them saying valuations are stretched and Morgan Stanley writing that they need to see further earnings upgrades in order for the shares to go higher. There is an index from Goldman Sachs that's been an absolute tear over the past two years. Here it is on the screen here. It's up another 40% this year alone. A 200% share price rise for that Goldman index, tracking a number of stocks since the start of 2022. So we can see why they are concerned around those valuations. Then staying in aerospace, we've also got another win for Airbus in its battle versus the big rival Boeing. We've got latest delivery numbers for March and it is swinging in Airbus's favour. They've got 63 or there we go, 63 for March and 142 for the quarter. Now that's much better than what we're seeing over at Boeing, which only had 83 and 29 respectively for the quarter and the month. Orders at Boeing actually halved over a yearly period, given the worries around the safety concerns and the investigations by the FAA. And we can see this playing into the two share prices, Airbus continuing to rally and Boeing coming down. We had reports yesterday about a whistleblower at Boeing worried about some of the potentially cutting corners in some production, something that Boeing strenuously denies. But that is feeding into this share price divergence between the two biggest plane makers in the world. And there we go. The analyst ratings are on Airbus. 19 buys, only two sales. This potentially feeding into that. Finally, we're looking at healthcare, healthcare tech. We've got an update from Philips in their long-running sleep apnea device issue. Now, a US court has approved the company's agreement with the US government over the issue, which will see them stop making devices in three facilities over in Pennsylvania. Now, we can see how these sleep apnea product recalls have really weighed on the stock over the past three years. There's a massive drop in that stock. The company actually saying they hope this will help them resolve the issue and move on. It is a, an issue that they've set aside a billion euros in order to resolve claims on, potentially a minor positive, but shutting down those facilities is a concern. Keep an eye on Phillips in Amsterdam.
Joe, thanks very much indeed. Joe, running us uh, up to the open in terms of the stocks we need to be focusing on. Macro day, though, single stocks, I think, are going to make a difference. I thought the defence story yesterday was fascinating. But today, we're basically counting down to 1.30. So what's that, 7.30 Eastern? A little bit later, we're going to get that CPI print out. We're going to get minutes from the Fed a little bit later on as well. Bank of Canada are out with numbers. There's a lot going on. But you've also got to fold TSMC into this. You've also got to fold Apple into this. There's yeah. lots of other kind of stories that are, that are definitely worth paying attention to. And the TSMC numbers, I think, are going to be interesting. So we'll see if there's a read across into European chip stocks this morning. I think we keep waiting for there to be. And I think the difference here is that ASML, for example, is the immediate one that comes to mind, even Infineon. They're trading more in line with what you see with the U.S. chip makers than you yep. do with, with the Asian chip makers. Even though TSMC is much, much larger, it seems to be more of a sentiment-driven thing. And I would argue even a size thing, a large cap story, as opposed to a, a chip fundamental story. Olaf Schultz is on TikTok. I am not on TikTok. But ByteDance is well, out with numbers. Well, you are still using key rings. So uh, we, well, we have work to do before getting you on TikTok. ByteDance profit, out with, uh, profit numbers are out hitting the screen this morning. Um, about 60, uh, they grew about 60% in 2023 to 40 billion. I do also wonder whether there's some positioning there for a sale. Uh, you want to make the numbers look good, don't you? Because at yeah. some point, maybe there is a sale that is going to be required of some of the assets. I mean... At least that's the going theory. Are they, are they even allowed to do that in the States? There's a lot of questions of legality around that. Even who would even want to touch that? Of course, the, the algorithm is the most sought-after piece of, of, of the story. I'm not on TikTok either, to be fair, but I'm told. <laughs> on, by design, though, I'm told that it's very addicting because the algorithm is so perfectly tailored to you. I think that may be, may be the issue that, that a lot of senators um, and those, on, those in Congress are, are so concerned about at the moment. Anyway, the market open is about to happen here in Europe. Uh, we are counting you down to the start. Start of trading here in Europe. Looks like we're going to see a positive start for equities. It's in a little reversal over the last kind of 24, 48 hours. The bond market, um, maybe we're seeing yields coming a little bit lower, so a bit back in there. Equity markets bouncing around all over the place. But looks like we're going to see a positive start of trading this morning. Looks like actually it could be a reasonably positive start. Like 7, 8 tenths of 1% is not a bad move for European equities, but it all hangs on that CPI print a little bit later. Anyway, the open is next. This is Bloomberg. Okay, good morning. Wednesday, the 10th of April. What are we watching? We're watching for equity markets to go a little bit higher this morning, but we're all anticipating the CPI print a little bit later on. Everybody's kind of sitting on their hands waiting to see what that ultimately looks like. It's a busy day, though, on the macro front. Bank of Canada, we've already had the RBNZ uh, out with numbers a little bit uh, earlier on or a statement out uh, a little bit earlier on. It sounded a little bit more hawkish. Uh, so you've got the Fed minutes coming up as well. It's a busy day, and we've got the ECB, of course, coming up tomorrow. So equity markets, bond markets have got a lot to think about this morning. They do. And I think, uh, again, it comes back down to how much maybe caution do we see at the start of open. I'm, I'm curious how much of this is really just a wait and see game until, as you mentioned, the inflation report later. Yep, I think it probably is just a wait and see game. There are some interesting single stock stories that we want to watch out for. Yeah. Do we continue with the defense story sell off we saw yesterday? How's Tesco going to react this morning in terms of its yeah. numbers? There's a couple of misses in there, but it does seem, yeah. as you say, that the cash return story probably is maybe the dominant theme that people maybe will focus on there. I mean, I am obsessed with the buyback story, but and, and yep. but even $1 billion of pounds in buybacks doesn't actually seem as big as we've seen in some of the other companies uh, that have reported the buyback story. It's been in a much larger scale uh, as well. The defense story is what catches my eye here because yep. it feels like every time you see that sort of mini correction in the defense story, it's still, they've, they've moved higher historically, but they're oh, still yeah. not as high or as expensive relative to like ASML or tech stocks, for example. No, it'd be interesting to see what the tech stock read across is from TSMC this morning. Is yeah. there going to be a read across story that we want to be watching out for as well? Best performing sector so far this year in Europe? car sector. Keep an eye on that one as well this morning. We'll be watching out uh, to see how that performs. Anyway, European equity markets are about to open. The headline that's really caught my eye, though, over the last few minutes, uh, European weather. Spain, Spain to exceed 28 degrees next week as spring sets in. There is hope for us all. Uh, let's take a look at what these markets look like as we come through in terms of the opening trades here in Europe. Uh, we, are looking, we are looking at a positive picture. That certainly seems to be the sense. In terms of some of the single stocks I'm watching out of the gate first thing this morning in terms of the impact. Shell is higher this morning. Schneider's also picking up a little bit of a trade as well, but it does look like energy stocks are going to be the early leader. 
Um, and it looks like maybe the FTSE 100 is already benefiting from that, up by a circa half of 1% already. LVMH up by a percent, bouncing back after yesterday's move. Yeah, we should very quickly mention some of the BMW heads that are yep. crossing uh, the Bloomberg Terminal. We're looking at global sales rising uh, something like 1.1%, uh, rising 2.5% in the first quarter. You're seeing sales drop, however, in Asia and China, but they're still saying that kind of consumer growth story happening in the States and happening in... Um, uh, happening in other parts of the world as well. So we'll have to see if there's a bigger read-through as we get a little bit more volume uh, kind of flow through. Absolutely. So there's a, a little story that's just dropping uh, on the screen right now. BMW EV sales climbed 28% in the first quarter. So we'll, uh, we'll come back to that BMW story in a moment. As I say, that is the sector that has been outperforming all others so far this year in Europe. In terms of the main sector stories that we are watching, though, look at all that. Green on the screen, pretty much across the piece. Banks rising. Remember, we get uh, JP Morgan reporting Friday. The bank story both front and centre by the end of the week. But everything looks like it's having a fairly solid week, a uh, fairly solid start to the day, though. Yeah. Um, basic resources up really quite nicely. Energy also rising, too. But it's, it's like a reasonably balanced market, it looks like, this morning. Most sectors seem to be rising and having a positive performance. But you know when you see that kind of breath, that immediately it's, is that a is that kind of a autopilot trade? Are people sitting back and just kind of riding the wave as opposed to kind of taking bigger positions. ASML, for example, is going to be your biggest index mover on the stock 600 in terms of the early, early uh, trades that you see, not to mention one of the top movers in the, in the Euro, Euro stock 50, I think. Absolutely, uh, but is that, is, that a TSMC, so is that a TSMC read across? See, that's the part I can't tell, and we can, we can ask our next guest this in a moment, but is that a, is that a fundamental story, or is that a when you don't, when you don't know what is going to happen next, you just dive into... If you're buying a basket, ASML is going to be a big part of that sure. basket, isn't it? We'll talk about the, kind of the Super 6 in just a moment. Kind of th those key stocks, if you're buying Europe this morning, you're going to be buying those key can stocks. Can I see, just say, you go from Core 6 to Super 6 to Sensation I'm kind of six. making it up as I it's go like, along. It's like a... We had six. I think that's, that, that's the critical thing. We, <laughs> could get six six. On a, we could get our six on a graphic. These are the six stocks uh, that, that we are paying attention to. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And look, it all comes in the in the kind of uh, background of some of the fiscal story as well. We talk about monetary policy. We talk about the fundamentals. The macro matters. Take a listen to what Catherine Nice over at PGM had to say to us earlier. In the decade before the pandemic, it was really monetary policy that was in the driving seat. Fiscal was really in the back seat. You know, austerity was the rule of the day. And we're basically seeing a flip of that. And it's fiscal that is in the driving seat. It's doing the heavy lifting, supporting economies. And it's monetary policy that's in the back seat, trying to restrain things and ensure that nominals don't run away from us. Catherine, Catherine Nice, the PGM Chief European Economist, there joining us earlier in the program. I want to get a little bit more context in terms of the market read-through of what she was saying there. Frederick Carrier joins us this morning, head of investment strategy for the British Isles in Asia over at RBC Wealth Management. Frederick, a pleasure to have you on the program. Let's talk about that fiscal impulse there. It makes a lot of sense from a European perspective or bond perspective. But when it comes to the equity market, what's the read-through? Uh, look, earnings. We need to see earnings growth, uh, particularly in uh, Europe. Um, we expect uh, subdued, uh, but still some uh, earnings growth and valuation levels are very attractive, particularly if you take um, European uh, stocks, if you uh, exclude the tech sector, the discount of European stocks to the US is at the, the deepest the, the biggest yeah. discount since 2011. So we see some value and we think that uh, people have uh, an old conception of European stocks. Many of our clients still think of Europe as being uh, the home of telecoms, utilities, very much like they were 10, 15 years ago. And as you uh, alluded to, they are now a lot more exciting growth oriented companies uh, which are part of the, of the index. We are talking about tech. She's talking about the, the six there, by the way. Just wanted to, just to make that clear. I, you know what? I, I don't have a hat to tip you, but noted. Guy was right, guys. It's okay. It happens every once in a while. Um, Frederic, talk to us about the defense story, though. This kind of mini correction that we're seeing in the defense stocks. We don't usually talk about defense valuations. It's coming into the narrative now at a time when we really don't know how to quantify that fiscal expansion, the investment from a lot of these European governments. Your take on the defense sector. So, um, look, it's a sector that's done very, very well over um, the past uh, 18 months. Uh, valuations are now 22 times. Uh, on average, historically, it's been 16 times. So a lot more expensive, but really it's a new paradigm in terms of defense in Europe. 
So it's a sector that we uh, see uh, as uh, still being very conducive to investments. Clearly, there's some ESG issues. But if you think that governments will continue to invest, national governments to invest in defense, um, defense spending has gone up 80 percent over the last 80 um, over the last uh, 10 years. Um, so we think there's still uh, still some uh, yeah. some potential. I would say that. A Trump uh, victory uh, might uh, create some uh, some hurdles uh, in the sector. Yeah, maybe a need for more spending, though. That could certainly be part of part of the narrative. Yes, we're also looking at the European Parliament uh, elections yeah. and whether the right wing uh, right wing parties start to have a lot more influence uh, in terms of uh, policies. They are not so um, happy about a European defence uh, policy, so that could crimp uh, growth. But the, the overall mega trend is for more investment in defence in Europe. How cheap is the UK? Do I want to own the FTSE, the FTSE 250 right now? The discount is enormous. There's lots of value in the UK. Yeah, but is it, I, when, when does that close? I, we, I feel like I've been talking about this for quite a while. You've been talking about that. We've all been talking about the yeah. valuation case for the UK for a very long time. Look, we don't see really... Um, an opportunity to close that gap in a sustainable basis. We look out for elections. Uh, yep. Perhaps some political stability will um, help reduce this discount somewhat. But really the point is that the UK lacks these stocks which people are looking for, the growth sector, the technology. Uh, the, uh, the role of the UK equities has really diminished over the last 10 years. It's now 4% of uh, global indices. Yep. Uh, and people, you know, institutional investors are just not putting the resources uh, in order to really look at this, um, at this stock market. So, yes, there are some value stocks. We um, look at particularly global leaders which trade at a very steep discount to their peers which are listed elsewhere. But it's not a, a, um, a, a market which we see as having a lot of potential. Clearly, a rally in energy stocks could really help it. But... It, it's difficult to make the case to really invest in this country at the moment. I'm confused about the case for investing in Europe broadly. And, and hear me out, because you hear two different narratives. And that one, it's European markets in, on, on the continent here in the UK are international markets at their core. So a lot of their kind of read through, a lot of their revenue comes from the states. And therefore, it is a catch up trade that's at play. On the other side of the equation, it's more of a macro story, which is there's some sort of reacceleration of the global economy driven by the states, and therefore the cyclical, more capex, industrial kind of tilt that these European markets have will favor that kind of pro-cyclical play. Which is it? Because those are two very different stories. It can be a little bit of both. There is definitely um, a resurgence of uh, stabilization in European um, growth, which will help companies overall for the index about 40 percent of earnings still come domestically so it is it is important but you have also these international companies these global leaders which happen to be listed in europe and trade at you know attractive valuations sometimes at discounts do valuations even matter if we're talking about a catch-up trade though well a catch-up trade if it's cheap uh yes but, they've, but Europe has historically been cheap. Like, are we comparing it to the U.S.? Because Europe will always be cheap relative to the U.S. The, the growth dynamic is different in Europe, yes. But valuations, it's always more comfortable to talk about yeah. catch-up trade when there's a valuation. Do I buy European well. equities if the Bank of England and the ECB are cutting rates? Is, is that a catalyst? Is that a potential catalyst for me, to make me want to think about it? Uh, so to have supportive monetary policy helps. Um, yeah. And uh, we see um, the... The economy in Europe stabilizing, in particularly wage growth yep. um, improving, real wage growth improving if inflation declines. So for, for us, it's more looking at these variables uh, than necessarily one rate cut. Okay, but if we see a, if we see divergence across the, I'm trying to figure out kind of for, for the catch-up trade to carry on, what do I, what ingredients do I need to see? We need, we need to see the growth improving slightly right. in Europe. That's what we need to see. Now, we, the European growth is never going to be like European, like uh, the US, US yeah. the US. It's a much more regulated it's, uh, economy, uh, aging population. Yeah. But what we need to see is a slight improvement. Already we saw 
less deterioration, stabilization, and what we need to see is a slight improvement. So growth north of 1% next year would be already good enough to provide some earnings momentum uh, in Europe. So then bring it back to then the, the valuation story. What is there a threshold where you say this is too expensive, this is not worth it? Valuation levels at the moment are not suggesting that. But yes, they would be at one point. Uh, if you look at the discrepancy, the discount becomes uh, really starts to close down. Yeah. Then, then yes, then it has happened in the past that European equities have become a little bit expensive. We, we don't have the growth, but we do have Florence. I'm just going to point that one out. I'm happy to, you know, take one for the team, invest. And visit Florence. And visit Florence. Spend a little bit of money. Charge to the Bloomberg Amex. Eat some more ties, <laughs> even. Even I'm, more ties. Yeah. More ties. I, got, I got a tie out of Critty's trip. There are so. Vespas on it. <laughs> there, there, there are. Um, in terms of sectors in Europe that we should be watching, auto has been the big outperformance so far this year. Is it? I, I'm surprised to see industrials doing what they're doing right now. Do these kinds of trends continue? What, what, if, if Europe is going to continue the catch-up trade, where is that kind of at a more granular level going to come from? So industrials is a good uh, place to, to start. We like those which are particularly um, underpinned by the mega trends. So the uh, electrification, the digitization, yep. defense is, is another one. Uh, less of a catch up there, but still some growth potential. We also like technology, the whole semiconductor supply chain um, and uh, mission critical software companies. Healthcare is, is another, um, another important yep. um, play for us. Never noticed because it's done quite well. It has. Frederick, thank you very much indeed. Nice to see you. Frederick Carrier, Head of Investment Strategy for the British Isles and Asia at RBC Wealth Management. Um, we'll go back to the, uh, the Call 6 and just show you exactly what's happening. We call them Sensational 6. I think Call 6 probably is maybe the best way to go. They're all higher this morning um, as Europe gets a, a little bit of a lift. Novo is only up a little bit, but look at that. LVMH, Ferrari. There we go, it's negative. LVMH, Ferrari, ASML, Schneider having a really good day, Nestle all tracking a little bit higher. So the, uh, the core six, this is kind of the core of the basket, all having a relatively good day with the exception of Nova Nordisk. But it's, it's had quite a good run. Those are some of the core stocks. What else are we watching this morning? Let us find out with Joe Easton. So these are how the defence stocks are opening up at the moment. We're up a couple of percent for Ryan Mattel. That was one of the big droppers yesterday, down as much as 7%. And the other stocks, Thales, Saab, Leonardo, all gaining. As you were discussing with Federic just a moment ago, some of these stocks trading at 20 times their earnings now. So we're not seeing a complete retracing of the move yesterday, but we are seeing small gains with some buyers coming back into the market on those ones. We've also got our eye on chips, as you mentioned earlier. TSMC in Taiwan reporting some really strong growth, a really good month for that company. So most of those stocks are gaining in Europe in terms of ASML, Infineon, SD Micro, the peers. We have got a big decline for Ikestron, though. This is as it gets a downgrade over at XA and BNP Paribas. So that one is standing out if you're wondering why that one is red today. Then a couple of single stock movers to bring you. We did mention earlier that news around Philips and there's the gain. 7%. That's the best gain for that stock since December last year. So the biggest gain in 2024. They are looking to resolve the issue around their sleep apnea devices in the US. A court has approved their agreement. They say it will help them move on and start producing some of those devices soon again. Then in terms of chocolate, one of our favourite stock sectors for sure. Barry Calibo over in Switzerland. That stock was up 10% at the open. It's up 7% at the moment. It is one of the largest makers of chocolate. The big rise in cocoa prices, though, that is actually negative for the company, given it's their main raw material cost. So that stock's down a lot already this year, but rebounding following some strong volume numbers today. Then we'll move over and have a look at a couple of the broker moves. We've got one for Eden Red. This is one of the worst performing stocks on the market today. We've got Jefferies going underperform. Multiple headwinds is what they're saying. One of them is competition in their food voucher programs. This is a company that make vouchers. They sell them into companies and they are given to staff and they say there's competition there. That stock on a bad run down 3.9% at the moment. Finally, it's those fancy cashmere sweaters doing well once again. Again, Brunello Cuccinelli, this stock had a really good run following some recent earnings. And they've got another outperform, another buy rating over at Auto BHF. They do rate that one and outperform. And that's up 1% in Italy, 98.25 at the moment, 110 price target upside in cashmere sweaters, according to Auto. That one's up in Milan.
All right, Joe Easton from our equities team, we thank you so much for walking us through the stocks to watch. Coming up on the program, at least three people have been killed after an explosion at an NL hydro power plant in northern Italy. We're going to have more on that story next. This is Bloomberg. This is Marcus Today. We're about just shy of 20 minutes into the European trading day. We are seeing green across the string. The stock 600 higher by about seven tenths of 1%. A lot going in their favor. Fairly broad rally that we are seeing this morning. I want to bring you some headlines that are crossing the Bloomberg terminal here. It looks like Chinese leader Xi Jinping is due to meet the former Taiwanese president who ruled uh, from 2008 to 2016. Of course, the self-ruled democracy there, marking the very first visit from a former Taiwan leader to the Chinese capital. It's largely expected to be a symbolic gesture, at least that's what they will be watching for. And this, of course, report coming from TVBS over at Taiwan. Another major story in the Taiwan space is TSMC. Their quarterly revenue growing at its fastest pace in more than a year. The result shoring up expectations that a global boom in artificial intelligence development is fueling demand for high-end chips and servers. Tim Culpin from Bloomberg Opinion joins us now this morning. Tim, Walk us through the numbers here. What did we learn? So the numbers came in at just ahead of uh, TSMC's own forecast for the quarter at about 18.8 .8 billion uh, US dollars. That's about 13 percent for the quarter, higher than a year ago. It's interesting to remember that last year, even though chips were kind of hot, TSMC had a decline in revenue last year. But they're not going to have a decline this year. They're already forecasting a very solid year. And so this is a very nice first quarter to get out of the way. Uh, and there's a lot of news ahead of us for this year, a lot more great chips in AI that are going to come online, as well as uh, smartphone chips and all sorts of other things that TSMC is going to be making for the rest of the world. Tim, huge amounts of demand for its products. It is broadening its manufacturing base. It's now going to be manufacturing in the United States following the announcement with the Biden administration that it's going to build factories in the U.S. How big a, how big a difference are those factories going to make to the, to the overall footprint that TSMC operates? Well, it's going to cost a lot of money, $65 billion over the next few years. But um, unfortunately, I'm sorry to blow uh, the bu bu burst the bubble of, of the U.S. that thinks it's going to be suddenly uh, a semiconductor king again. It's going to account for, like, not even 10 percent of TSMC's global capacity, somewhere around 5 to 7 percent of global capacity when it's all up and running. So it's not a big deal for TSMC. They're doing it mostly for political reasons. They are getting a bit of a, I guess you'd call it a kickback, these incentives that were announced recently. 6.6 billion U.S. dollars sounds like a lot, but again, out of 65 billion dollars of expenditure, it's not that much. Uh, but it's all political. TSMC is really very much stuck in Taiwan. Uh, they will be for the foreseeable future. We have earthquakes here, we have typhoons, we have the risk from uh, our uh, neighbour over the other side of the Taiwan Strait. So there's a lot of uh, kind of geopolitical uh, risk in Taiwan. But that doesn't change the fact that TSMC is here and what it's going to do in the U.S. is important symbolically. But in terms of production, yeah, not a big deal. Tim, I can appreciate how it is a symbolic gesture. I'm curious if that symbolic gesture even lasts going into the next administration. Are there concerns about that on the ground? Well, there is a sense that, you know, uh, obviously, if a, there is a new administration coming into the U.S. Uh, after the election this year, yeah, maybe things will change. But right now it looks like this is pretty much set in concrete. It's passed through Congress. Uh, Commerce and Treasury have the rules out there. Gina Raimondo... Uh, has announced these uh, incentives that it will go to TSMC. Other companies like Intel and Samsung are getting them as well. So I don't think there's a sense that it'll all be rolled back. It would be very, very unusual if a new administration came in to roll it back, but anything's possible. TSMC pretty much is committed, at least for a few phases of its plans. So I think it's pretty much going to be uh, all steam ahead. You mentioned Intel. Let's talk a little bit about Intel for a moment, Tim. Announcing a new accelerator that it hopes will allow it to compete to a certain extent with NVIDIA. Do you think NVIDIA is worried? Yeah, I don't think they are. Um, look, this new Gaudi 3 chip that Pat Gelsinger announced uh, this week, uh, it looks kind of good. Uh, they, he says it's better than uh, NVIDIA's older chip, but it's probably on par with NVIDIA's latest chip. It's going to come out later. 
than NVIDIA's latest chip. So uh, I don't think NVIDIA will be quaking in its boots, to be honest. And, you know, let me tell you something ironic. It's good for TSMC because even though Intel is starting its own foundry business, which uh, competes directly with TSMC, this new Gaudi chip will be made by TSMC at their 5 nanometer process. So whether people go out and buy an NVIDIA chip or an AMD chip or an Intel chip, TSMC still gets the revenue. Yep. And you can see those numbers strong this morning. Tim, thanks for the catch-up. Really appreciate it. Tim Culpin from Bloomberg Opinion. What's happening in the chip space? Um, let's turn our attention to something that happened in Italy yesterday. We're continuing to track what the news looks like. So Bloomberg has learned that at least three people have been killed, five seriously injured. We're still looking for people as well. This after an explosion at a hydro power plant in northern Italy. This is kind of between Florence and Bologna in northern Italy. Rescue is still very much looking for survivors. Let's get uh, an update with Chiara Albanese. Chiara, just kind of walk us through what this plant does and what happened and how this accident took place. Yes, um, the, the plant really uses the, the power of the, the nearby lake and river um, to generate energy and is a plant that operates underwater. Uh, what happened yesterday in the afternoon, there was an explosion below the surface of the water. Um, so um, a lot of people are missing at the moment. Three, as you were saying, uh, have been confirmed dead. But it's very hard to continue the rescue operations because those are happening underwater. Uh, so at the moment, the, the focus is really on rescuing uh, the missing people and trying to understand the extent of the damage, which is very hard to do because it's nine levels below the surface. Has there been any clarity on how Enel has responded or any kind of understanding of how this took place to begin with? The company has not said much until now they have said that they are cooperating with the authorities. The CEO of the NL unit, which um, was operating the plant, NL Green Power, has, been, uh, has gone on location. But uh, there are still a lot of questions lingering about what happened, responsibilities, and which other contractors were uh, operating the site. Okay. Chiara, is there a grid impact here in terms of Italy's electricity supply? This was, as you described it, effectively a hydro plant that stores electricity. It's basically a kind of water battery for the electricity grid. Do we know how long it could be out of action? Clearly, we're obviously still in the kind of the search and rescue phase of this. But what, what, is, there, is there a longer term potential impact on, on electricity supply? So for the moment, the, the, the lack of supply from that plant has been compensated from other sides. The, the Italian grid has been compensating, so there are no shortages in supply. Clearly, the damage over the long term, if the plant will require months of work to be operational again, will be felt by NL and by, by the Italian system. All right, Bloomberg's Chiara Albanese, we thank you so much for joining the program. Uh, this is going to be something that we continue to monitor, of course, on Bloomberg Television and Radio. But coming up on the program, we're going to take a look at the oil space and the wider commodities read-through as well. Francisco Blanche, head of global commodities over at Bank of America Global Research, will join us. We'll talk about the read-through, not just yep. from the Middle East, but from the United States as well. So oil's been trading higher. We've, we're kind of circa 90 bucks a barrel right now. Gold's been on an absolute tear. Copper's been moving higher. Even iron ore's started to tick higher as well. Commodities traders are making a lot of money right now. Does this trend continue? What's the inflationary impact of all of this as well? That's going to be something that we're going to be talking about with Francisco. He is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This market today, we're about 30 minutes into the European trading day. Green on the screen when we look at those equity markets. When you look at the commodity markets, a little bit of green on the screen there as well. Especially look at 89 handle on Brent crude, 23.56 on gold. But I'm going to really zero in on the oil story. Oil holding a two-day decline after a report points to rising U.S. inventories. Middle East tensions, OPEC plus production curve expected to cap losses. There's a lot to dive into. Luckily, we have the perfect guest. Francisco Blanche, head of global commodities over Bank of America Global Research, joins us on set this time. We're thrilled to have you. This oil story, how much of it is fundamentally driven? How much of it is just a momentum trade? Well, I mean, there's a lot of fundamental uh, drivers here at work. We've had, remember, uh, since the uh, uh, Houthis started shooting at ships uh, in the uh, Red Sea, We've had a lot of disruptions, but importantly, we've had 
longer trade routes, uh, faster, um, faster ships. Ships are on average 10 percent faster than they were uh, pre-war. So that takes a lot more fuel. Uh, so a lot of the world commerce is, is really uh, um, kind of picking up. And then we have, of course, uh, an important uplift in cyclical conditions, right? Yep. It's one of the reasons why everyone's wondering if the Fed is really going to cut rates or not uh, in June. We started the year with six and a half rate cuts, remember? Um, price then, and then we've quickly moved to maybe two and a half, right? So the economy is better. Uh, we have longer routes, more geopolitical risk, and, and of course, any news of a, a potential ceasefire in Gaza um, are going to be uh, leading to, to a bit of a sell-off because maybe that means you can reopen the Red Sea to all that, all that shipping traffic and, and reduce the pressure. So, it, but, so from what I'm hearing from you, it does sound like the, 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 the tensions in the Middle East are actually factoring in to the oil price at a time when I think a lot of people were struggling to see whether these kind of tit-for-tat measures between right. Israel and Iran were having some sort of more direct read-through. You're saying they are. No, I mean, I'm talking specifically about the Red Sea, okay. right? I mean, commodity markets don't tend to uh, price uh, risk until, until it kind of happens, right? Um, they, commodity markets, they see a little risk, they, they build up a bit, but it's, it's really when we get that big disruption, when we get that shut-in of production, yeah. that refinery being hit by a drone, that, that things start to move. Uh, because, you know, it's really hard to, to price something that hasn't happened and you know if it's going to happen or if it's not going to happen or, or maybe it is. Uh, so. Do I buy or sell commodities if the Fed doesn't cut rates? Um, I, I, think, I still think you want to be in commodities, Guy. And I think, I think you want to be, this is a great time to be in commodities. We're seeing gold, oil, copper, the entire load going up. And, and, and part of it, right, I mean, we had a two-year decline from the uh, Ukraine uh, invasion into the first quarter. And since the first quarter, all these factors I talk about on the demand side, things are getting better. But also importantly, uh, we're starting to see supply uh, issues emerge in, in commodities like copper. Uh, we just revised our forecast. We have a $12,000 target for copper. We revised our gold target to $3,000. Um, and, and we still think oil hits 95 into the summer months. Uh, and this is the, the asset class that I think is going to help you a little bit if the Fed decides not to cut rates and you have a sell-off in bonds and equities. Uh, but if they, because if they decide not to cut rates, it's likely because commodities are going up yeah. and inflation is resurfacing, right? So that is the reason you own commodities in this cycle. Let's break that apart. Let's start with gold. How price insensitive are central banks right now? Because it doesn't matter if bond yields go up or down, inflation goes up or down, anything goes up and down. Gold seems to be rising right now. Are these, are these price insensitive buyers? Uh, in, in, in a way, they are. And, and what we've seen is, is this buy-the-dip mentality by central banks. And why are central banks buying gold? Very simply because central banks don't trust central banks. Uh, right. So this is an inflation story. Do you think this is a trust in the financial system trade? I think it's both, right? I think it's an inflation story, but it's also trust in the financial system because of what happened to a Russian central bank, right? Uh, remember uh, that when Russia went into Ukraine, they had $650 billion in reserve assets. And a few weeks later, they had half the money. Um, and this is a permanent member of the Security Council. So if, if that can happen to Russia, it can happen to anybody. And what we've seen is a widespread, widespread buying of gold across the central bank community. And this doesn't go just for, let's say, traditional um, foes or adversaries of the U.S. or, you know, commercial rivals uh, like China, which has yeah. been buying gold for a while. It's just, it's just also your allies are buying gold. Countries like Singapore, countries like Turkey, NATO members or or traditional defense allies or, or former British trading posts, right? And they are buying because they say, well, you know, the world's fracturing. We have a big geopolitical fracture at work. And where do we sit here, right? In Singapore, yes, I mean, traditional U.S., British ally, but lots of Chinese people, lots of Chinese people. Turkey, NATO member, but very close to the Middle East, very close to Russia, right? Yeah. How do you balance all that out? And the answer the central banks are coming down to is gold. And then, of course, there's the inflation story. And let's not forget the budget story. We can't seem to be able to fix our own government budgets. Yep. How much of it as well a, a, a growth story coming out of China? It's interesting that you're talking about this kind of bullishness in commodities when Chinese weakness is so prevalent, European weakness is so prevalent. Is the U.S. consumer story or the U.S. resilience enough to support gold, copper, and oil? So... Not, not every commodity is going to rally. That, that I think, it's, it's clear. This commodity is going to be so, somewhat soft. Um, but I think, first of all, China is doing a little better. We've seen uh, PMIs uh, pointing up. We've seen new orders in China uh, specifically uh, doing a lot better. The housing sector finding some stability. 
and, and global commerce is starting to pick up. Because remember, uh, for the last couple of years, as rates went up, inventories went down. And inventories go down because corporate managers, they find it more expensive to finance those stocks. So we saw finished goods inventories, intermediate goods inventories, commodity raw material inventories coming down. And now we have to rebuild them because we're not going into recession. I mean, the story is not so much that... that uh, the world's booming. The story is that we are not going to recession. So we need yeah. to rebuild stocks to meet the demand that's not going away, despite the higher rates. People have been talking about a copper shortage for a long time. Yeah. Are we here now? Is that it? We're here now. We, we just put a report out yesterday uh, saying that the copper supply crisis is here. And, um, and we think that this is the one commodity that's going to really benefit from uh, the How energy transition. That? How do I make that work? Well, th there's, there's mainly two ways. So you, can, you can buy commodities directly, right? Uh, whether it's copper, uh, ETFs, futures, yep. uh, or, or exposure to a commodity index. Alternatively, uh, you can also buy some of the equities. Now, I'm not an equity analyst, but there's a range of equities that Bank of America recommends that you should be buying to get exposure to the copper idea. And, and we think, you know, we think copper is going to be at least 30% higher over the course of the next 12 months, uh, maybe more. Uh, if you're talking about sens insensitive price buyers, look for people look, that need to build a grid, need yep. to improve the electric grid. Yeah. No matter what the price is, you've got to build those data centers. They're coming through. You need to have the power to do it. You need the grid. You have a lot of renewals because you want to transition, yeah. and you need to connect those renewals to the grid and you need to improve the grid, and that takes a lot of copper. And you also want to have your electric car. All of that, like I said, is a big confluence on the red metal. We've covered a lot of the metals. We've covered oil. I need to throw a curveball at you and talk about the soft commodities here. Okay. Uh, the inflationary story seems to be picking up that it's more goods-driven inflation, commodity-driven inflation. Services may start be coming down. Are you seeing that trend in food inflation as well, grains, et cetera? So, the, the uh, agriculture complex is, is, a bit of a, is, is, is a bit split. You have certainly a lot of pressure on the soft commodities, but you have a lot less pressure on the grains. Now, let me, let me explain why that is the case. So the grains are highly integrated into the energy supply chains. Ethanol, right? Corn-based ethanol. Um, biofuels like, like biodiesel. I mean, they're based off soy. There's a great connectivity that complex to the energy complex. If energy really starts ripping, you're going to see those commodities move higher. Now, the supply side is very fragmented there, so it's difficult for corn to double and triple and triple again because again, there's so many farmers, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, the, the soft commodities are different because soft commodities are highly, highly concentrated in a few countries in terms of supply. And, and you know, we've seen it with cocoa. Uh, there's also starting to see pressure. We're starting to see pressure on coffee, right? So we may have to uh, find teas. Getting now. serious. I was going <laughs> to say, talk, talk to me about gelato inflation, and espresso inflation, all those things. That's the mindset I'm at. I'm at. Coffee and coffee, oh, yeah, coffee and chocolate. Now, yeah, that is <laughs> coffee is, and chocolate. That, the, the, this is serious stuff. So, yeah, we've seen the concentration. You said, you said, if we really see inflation, if we really see energy rip. What, what does it, energy ripping look like to you? Well, I mean, I think we're looking for ninety-five dollars a barrel as a target, right, for yeah. Brent. Uh, could it go a lot higher? It depends a little bit on the Saudis, right? I mean, the Saudis hold a lot of spare capacity. They got 5 million barrels a day. OPEC collectively has sitting, yeah. sitting on 5 million barrels a day of spare capacity. So I don't think it's going to happen necessarily. Yeah. Right? They'll, they'll open the taps. It's an election year. The last thing they want to do is interfere in the U.S. election, in my view, right? Uh, so they'll try to keep a price stability. That's what they're out for. Um, but there could be a policy mistake. Um, or there could be another geopolitical event. Um, or, or maybe demand ends up being a lot, lot stronger. Yeah. Uh, because in this post-COVID world, we all want to spend, 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 rather than save, 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 right? So, which is ultimately what this is about. All right, Francisco Blanche, Head of Global Commodities, Equity Derivatives, and Cross-Asset Quantitative Investment Strategies over at Bank of America Research. We have thrown everything at him, and yeah. he has handled it. The, the like takeaway is that coffee prices are going higher and chocolate prices are already pretty high. That's Breakfast like, of champions, I think. If marmalade prices <laughs> go up, we're in real trouble. I, Ew, what? <laughs> I can't. Uh, if we go from oil, the oil story, the commodity story, the marmalade story, to perhaps one a little bit more serious, Europe's defense stocks up slightly today after a big slide on a Goldman Sachs warning of peak multiples on defense firms. We're going to dive into the nitty-gritty that next. This is Bloomberg.
Uh, big sell-off in defence stocks yesterday. Today we bounce back a little bit. European equities broadly bouncing back, as you can see, but we're kind of parking this story. We're waiting for the CPI print uh, a little bit later on. But defence definitely got dinged up by a GS note, Goldman Sachs note, yesterday, maybe talking about stretched valuations. Um, we do seem to be coming back quite nicely off the back of that. Let's kind of look into why... Maybe that trade was put on yesterday. Oli Crook joins us from Berlin. He's been tracking this sector. Oli, yesterday's price action, was it just a we've pushed it a little too far and therefore maybe it's time to take a few chips off the table but the trend is still in track, intact? Or is it a maybe the trend's starting to get a little, little too... Maybe the trend is starting to come under a little bit of pressure as well? I think it's probably more the former than the latter. I mean, we had the worst sell-off in about 18 months for many of these names. You know, Saab was down as much as 10%. We're clawing some of that back right now. And I think a lot of people, though there wasn't a really very clear sort of news catalyst, we're tracing it back to that Goldman note, which were really talking about the valuations and looking at the PEs. And what they were looking at specifically was a 45% premium for these defense stocks over the stock 600 versus the past, where they usually traded at about a 7% discount. But again, we need to put this into context, Guy, of what we've seen over the last two years, really, because that really makes all of the difference. And you really need to pick your superlatives here because there are just so many. Looking just at Rheinmetall, we're talking about a stock that has rallied 450 percent since the invasion of Ukraine, the third best performing on the MSCI World Index. And I was looking at the price to earnings ratios. Right. Ryan Mittal trades at a higher P.E. ratio than Apple. These are all things that were completely inconceivable a couple of years ago. And I think for investors trying to figure out what this new world looks like, getting pricing out into the market is going to take a little while. Ali, how does the politics play into all of this? We just had Francisco Blanche talking to us about these kind of um, politics behind a lot of these pledges, basically. What is the read through into the corporate side? Yeah, so what I think is very interesting is you have the EU elections coming up and you have this sort of thought that potentially it will go much more to the right. And you had some guests talking about this on a little bit earlier. What does that mean for the sort of defense spending? What I think is interesting is that I think everyone is more or less unified on what needs to happen here, which is much more spending coming out of Europe to the defense sector. The question is going to be how you pay for it, which has been the crucial question for you know, us on Bloomberg for a very long time. But there are really only four options, right? You can, only, you can raise taxes, raise debt, cut from other parts of the government budget or grow yourself out of it. Growing yourself out of it has not really been the European strong suit. If you're looking at cuts to other parts of the budget, that's always very difficult politically. You're talking about raising debt. There is not that much fiscal headroom across uh, Europe, and raising taxes is raising taxes. So I think what you're going to see is the right going to be sort of much more in favor of cutting across welfare and taking the money there, whereas the other side of it is going to be maybe raising collective debt. But as we know, and you know, Guy, Creedy, we've spent many, many years talking about this very contentious issue in Europe. Can you really get there? And the question is, for investors, they need to plug all of these different variables into a very complex equation of basically trying to price this new paradigm. So I think for these defense stocks, it's fair to say we haven't arrived quite at that price just yet. Yeah, it was interesting, Francisco, was talking about just kind of where does the metal come from? Where do we get the kit to build right. the stuff that we need? Or where do we get the stuff to build the kit that we need? Uh, it is an open question as well. So many variables in this story. Ollie, thanks for the update. Greatly appreciated. Ollie Crook joining us uh, out of Berlin on that story. Oil kind of holding a little bit of a two-day decline. We're kind of in and around the 90 bucks a barrel story on Brent. Simmering tensions, of course, in the Middle East, presenting potentially bullish tailwinds. Israeli forces preparing for an offensive in Rafah. We're keeping an eye on what is happening there. We're looking for the Iranian response uh, to the attack on the consulate we saw in Syria last week. Uh, Ramona Mubarak, head of MENA, Country Risk and Global Banking, BMI at Fitch Solutions, joining us now to give us an assessment of this. Let's start off talking about that Iranian story because on Friday we were trying to work out what that response would look like and whether it was something that the energy market would be having to pay attention to. We haven't seen that response yet. We're all scratching our heads trying to work out what ultimately it's going to look like. What is your assessment of how the Iranians are going to deal with this story? What does that look like? Well... The MENA region is currently at an important junction between a ceasefire and escalation with possible Itali Iranian retaliation and expansion of ground operations into Rafah. So the Iranians and media reports pointed that they are linking their retaliation to a ceasefire a negotiation or a possible uh, successful negotiation into the ceasefire. Now, um, that said, 
uh, risks uh, that Israel will go into Rafah and failure of uh, the uh, ceasefire remain very high. So, for instance, if the Israeli leadership considers concessions difficult to offer in the current negotiations, yep. then we will be looking at an invasion of uh, Rafah. And this, in this case, uh, Iran has three choices. Uh, retaliate directly, um, indirectly through its network in the region, and not retaliate uh, now. And each scenario has its own implications on geopolitical risks in MENA and, and the oil markets. OK, let's just talk about some of those probabilities, Ramona. Is, is the base case still for escalation or is it increasingly looking like de-escalation? <clears throat> Well, we're more likely now leaning towards a ceasefire uh, in terms of uh, 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 so de-escalation at this point in time. Several factors are converging that makes a ceasefire more likely now than, let's say, prior to uh, the key events that happened over the past week or so. Uh, first, the international pressure on Israel is rising especially after the killing of the seven World Central Kitchen Aid workers in Gaza. Domestic pressure in Israel on the government to release the remaining hostages, especially that after six months of war, they failed to secure their release and neutralize Hamas military capabilities and leadership. And three, the credible risk of Iranian ret retaliation. This last point is a bit critical because this event specifically goes against U.S. interest of keeping current turmoil contained in the region and oil prices at a level that does not lead to renewed inflationary pressures, especially in an election year. So the conversion of these events kind of provided an opportunity for the U.S. to step up its pressure on Israel to make some concessions. Um, Israel did withdraw most of its troops from Gaza and increased aid entry into the Strip. And also on Hamas' sides, these concessions plus uh, Qatari pressure, and now Iranian pressure, will make this group more likely to accept a ceasefire. So overall, we're leaning, leaning towards de-escalation. And in all cases, even if you link it to oil prices, the premium and the, the geopolitical risk hasn't been tied. So, so kind, of, kind of aligned with what uh, the story on the oil market is saying now. Ramona Tkridi in London, uh, when we look at the Iranian output story and potential sanctions that may actually follow, in the last year or so, there has been an uptick just based off OPEC data we get on the Bloomberg terminal in that Iranian supply story. What are the prospects of more barrels hitting the market? Uh, more Iranian barrels hitting the market at this stage. Um, so last year, Iran did ramp up uh, um, its oil production. Uh, but it's unlikely to, um, to um, let's say, lead to a similar increase uh, this year as well. Uh, this is mostly because of uh, China's economy, and China is the main uh, uh, import market from, uh, of uh, Iranian oil. So the story or the possibility of Iranian ramping up their production is unlikely in, 20, in 2024 on this, uh, at this moment. Ramona, you talked a little bit about the regional response as well, as opposed to the kind of containment strategy of the United States. Talk to us about Jordan. Talk to us about Lebanon uh, very quickly, if you can, just given I think Jordan has the largest Palestinian population outside of, of Palestine itself. Walk us through the kind of regional ramifications between those two uh, regional economies. Well, yes, Jordan does have the largest uh, um, um, population uh, of uh, Palestinian origin in the region, and it has seen some um, protest against uh, the war, uh, protesting against the war in Gaza uh, over the past two weeks or so. Um, so now, if you look at it from a, 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 what's happening, so the longer the war in Gaza continues, the, the, the riskier the situation will get. But in our opinion, like this would remain contained, it will remain directed at a specific event, which is uh, the war in Gaza, and not escalate to a point that it will uh, jeopardize or put at risk security conditions in the country. Uh, for Lebanon, the situation is a bit trickier. Uh, because we have uh, seen recently increased in some uh, domestic tensions, uh, but also a sustained increase in the intensity of fighting between um, Hezbollah and, uh, and Israel. Uh, but 
like while the confrontation is now at a higher trajectory, the it's still below the level of a full-scale military uh, confrontation, and we don't see this happening in in. Uh, in Lebanon. This is not our core view. Hezbollah has its own domestic consideration to factor in when it decides to escalate and if it decides to escalate. All right, Ramona Mubarak, head of Amina Country Risk and Global Banking at BMI Fitch Solutions. We thank you so much for joining the program. Of course, we're going to watch the oil rate through the commodity rate through off the geopolitical story there as well. A couple of other things on our dock at about 12 p.m. UK time, we get some data out of the states. U.S. MBA mortgage applications, which traditionally isn't that exciting to watch, but we do want to keep an eye on the housing story, which is likely to be a really big input or potentially output of the U.S. CPI data. That coming in about 1:30 p.m. UK time does shelter move the needle for the Federal Reserve. At 6 p.m. UK time, more coming out of the States. This time, in terms of liquidity, in terms of supply, we've got a 10-year note auction worth about $39 billion. And at 7 p.m. London time, we do get those Fed meeting minutes are going to get released, plus the U.S. monthly budget statement. There is actually a lot to digest there. So I feel like in 24 hours, we've got a couple of different trading yep. stories, not just inflation. I think that probably will dominate. But you, sure. you, we've also got the Bank of Canada to throw into the mix as well. The auction story, I think, is going to be fascinating. Ten-year auction today, plus also the CPI print. Are we heading towards four and a half? Do we go beyond yeah. four and a half on a ten-year? People are talking about five. But real divergence beginning to emerge in terms of people's views on what the Fed does next. It, it's still striking to me that liquidity is not a concern anymore. And I think it's simply because that positioning story that we had yep. Aline on earlier. Because uh, I remember Bob Michael uh, over at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, yep. that CIO fixed income there, a couple of, like, maybe six months ago, at the end of last year had kind of said that there is unsatiable demand for bonds. Look at the positioning story. No one's diving into bonds kind of head first the way right. that maybe they did earlier on. And I'm curious if that's why the liquidity story has kind of dissipated and maybe if it'll come back given some more geopolitical Some of the risk. funding story on the credit markets as well has also been heavily front-loaded yeah. into the first half of the year. So it'll be interesting to see as that starts to, to eke out what impact that has in terms of pricing as well. But I don't know, the next 24 hours, you, you've got You've got a few Fed speakers to throw into the mix as well. Some of those yeah. are coming after the CPI print. What are they going to do, do in terms of the narrative that's coming up? 1.30, I'm definitely going to be tuning in. Well, we've had a lot of kind of uh, stories of, of divergence in terms of the, the, the story there. For me, it was Raphael Bostic's comments basically saying that, look, maybe it's not labor that we should be paying attention to. Yeah. Tomorrow's ECB day as well. Oh, I, we, we didn't even we, talk about that. Bear, I, which I find amazing. I was talking yeah. to Anna about this yesterday. I find it absolutely amazing. Oh, we'll do plenty of that tomorrow, oh, of yeah. course. Well, that does it for Markets Today. We've got the Pulse up next. Uh, I'll be walking you through it. We're going to talk about some of the major stories, corporate, macro. We've got it all for you. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.